Welcome to NIDENT's Voices in Video, and thanks for joining us. Today we host Will Law, a chief architect at Akamai, who has over 23 years of experience in streaming media and expertise in media over quick, dash, HLS, and low latency OTT delivery. Will is a rambling wreck from Georgia Tech and a heck of an engineer, we won't ask how he drinks his whiskey, who holds a master's degree in aerospace engineering and an MBA and has a notable industry presence, having co-chaired the W3C Web Transport Working Group and the CTA Wave Task Force that will simplify streaming for the entire ecosystem from publisher to player vendor. Personally, Will was always a patient and knowledgeable source for many articles that are read for streaming media on topics like CMAP and low latency. He's taught me a lot, and today he's here to teach you a lot. Specifically, in this podcast, we'll discuss a range of topics, including edge computing for media and its practical applications, per session watermarking and encryption techniques, manifest manipulation, low latency video, where Will was a true pioneer, Google Chunky Monkey and Will Law, if you haven't seen that presentation, media over quick, and trends in high density transcoding. Welcome, Will. Thanks for joining us. Thank you very much. That was a very kind introduction, so I um, appreciate it. And it's been a pleasure working with you over these years, and it's nice to have this time to, to have a talk. So thank you. Our pleasure. So we're going to go about 45 minutes today, and we'll try and answer questions as they come in. Um, if not, we'll get to them after that. Will, let's, let's jump right in. Um, tell us, you know, I, I've, I've kind of covered a little bit about yourself. Why don't you add anything you feel is essential and then jump into Akamai and talk about its architecture because I think its architecture really lends itself to a lot of things we're going to be talking about today. I've been at Akamai 16 years now which was probably not the plan when I joined it at the time but it's it's been a great place to work and it's a place that's evolving and changing so I think a lot of people consider Akamai as a CDN and they put Akamai purely in the CDN bucket. But CDN today is, is about a third of our business. And the other two legs of the Akamai stool that, that are now grow, the fastest growing legs are security, security side of the business. And then the newest one we have is compute. So between delivery, security, and compute, it's, it's a really thriving business. We had excellent results uh, two weeks ago. And we've hung in there. I think there's, there's, there's some stat, and I don't want to misquote it, about startups in 1999 that are now worth more than 15 billion dollars and are still around i think there's only five of them or so and it's some like google that you know well but one of them is akamai so we've actually uh, been a player for a long time and this there's, there's still a startup mentality in many people's minds but it's been two decades now so we really can't claim startup i think we've we've passed the the, the threshold for uh, getting into as a mature company. Impressive. Uh, yeah, I, I came into Akamai always on the media side. So I came in running player engineering, came from Flash background. Flash one day solved all my interop problems I had with Windows Media and Real Media. And I think it was a great tool. I think its its history was skewered a bit by the failure of, of Apple to support it. But we certainly had demos, media capabilities in the mid noughties that we weren't going to have for another 10 years with, with raw HTML. So there was a bit of a setback there, but that's when I joined Akamai. And then I worked a lot on the player side, um, wrote libraries and wrote software. Then I became more of a manager of our player engineering team. And then I shifted more into an architect role. And I think for the last five or six years, I've been in a chief architect role. And for those who want to complain about our product roadmap, I'm not the product architect. That's Kevin Johns. He's an excellent product architect. He has a team of product architects under him. Uh, so I work a lot in the industry. I, am, I, I uh, spend time in the standards world, and I try to work on things that lift the entire industry. It lifts the Akamai boat, but it also lifts other boats. But at the end of the day, it's, that's good for business. So that's why we invest a lot of time and money at Akamai into interop, uh, interoperable standards. One of the first times we connected was with CMath and I just didn't get it. It's like, what do we need another format for? And um, CMath has really come a long way. I mean, that's the whole focus of the of the WAVE project, which really, um, where, where's the WAVE project today? I mean, how far along is it on the, on the journey? Oh, WAVE of... is very active. So WAVE is a, a funny name. It had an even funnier name in the beginning. It was called the GIVE Project, Global Internet Video Ecosystem. It was terrible. People thought it was a charity for video engineers. 
which is not a bad idea, but it's not a charity for video engineers. It's it's uh, the CTA is is the group that runs the CES trade show. So they represent all all the vendors of of uh, electronic items, but also of televisions. And they were quite astute in realizing that the the, the entertainment landscape was switching, uh, and that OTT was a new and powerful entrant in in the media and entertainment market. And there were still a lot of gaps. The, the broadcast world is heavily defined by standards and it's mature. But in OTT, there's still interrupt gaps. So the, the goal of WAVE, very simply, is to remove interrupt problems for OTT streaming. And there's interrupt problems around the specification of content. There's interrupt about how a TV device renders video, how, how it plays it back inside a browser. So WAVE's done a bunch of tooling. It's I think it's eight years old at this point or some, mm. something like that. It's been around and it's quite productive. And then we've branched out recently into observability. So CMCD is one of the most popular specs we've made in WAVE. That's a group that I chaired uh, for V1. It's been out for two years. We're getting a, a lot of pickup right now. And we've just started work on CMCD V2. So public service announcement, if, if people care about what V2 looks like, and there's certainly a good diversity of opinion on what it should look like, um, then I think that people can uh, get involved uh, in WAVE. And if you're an SVTA member, you get automatically the ability to participate in the WAVE meetings, which is a nice entree and we get a good good group of uh, people coming in through SVTA. It's kind of remarkable. You can criticize NTSC, but at least you knew when you when you turned on your TV, it would play video from ABC. And there's there's no consistent specification that does the same thing for streaming. So Netflix and Amazon Prime and Hulu spend a fortune on compatibility of players. And it's it's silly. And and really that's what you're that's one of the things that you're probably yeah, is. you've got to trade it off, right? Because if you if you also look at television, it's monolithic. There was only one way to send TV to TV sets for a long time, right? Three three evolutions of of broadcast from analog switching to digital that was a big one and now we have next gen TV right but these are these gaps are are decades apart and you can't go off and innovate on a slightly better version of TV you have to lift mm. the whole country up at the same time so you get the reliability and security but it's from a very common baseline whereas in OTT we can have someone who says I want to do HDR I want to do 3D I want to do something different. And you can go do it. It's a much more flexible distribution mechanism. But at the same time, the the problem you just raised, which is diversity of players, diversity of formats, and interrupt between them. So you want to strike a blend. You want standards like HLS and Dash, which have lots of permutations within them, but still, still provide a general field. And then you can provide constraints within those around which you can run businesses, right? But you can always make something new and that's the exciting part of it. Why don't you, you know, from a CDN perspective, could you describe Akamai's architecture and and kind of what makes it special um, or at least- Yeah, what... so Akamai's differentiated itself from the beginning from other CDNs just on the diversity, it's highly distributed. So a lot of con CDNs or content providers will say we have 10 or 20 or 50 or 100 pops around the world, points of presence, places from which you egress content. Akamai today is about 4,200. So our goal is to be inside every AS or significant AS del delivering media to customers in the world. So we're in, in a city, we're in multiple ASs with, and peering points within those cities. So we're highly distributed. And there's a cost for that. It's more expensive to go mount servers in 4,000 locations than it is to mount them in 40 locations, but we reap a huge benefit. We get a huge surface from which to deliver content. We get a huge surface from which to deflect DDoS attacks. And we can run an overlay network. We can, from each of our points of presence, we can map connectivity to our other points of presence. And then we don't have to follow BGP routing. We can route directly. At least that's what we did for many decades. Today, we, we've started to connect fiber between our major points. It's just we have so much traffic that it's worth our while to lay our own network down. And we've laid what's called Akamai Fabric. Uh, and it's our next level into interconnect between our centers. But we're, we're a highly distributed edge. And we used to only use the internet to move between the edges. 
but today we have a private network that we can fully utilize and it gives us very good cost efficiency for that so when we talk about edge computing you guys you guys have a lot of edges we have a lot of edges, but we didn't have a lot of compute, right? We just had delivery. We had our code running on our edges and nobody else's code. So the big change was last year when we acquired Linode as a, as a, as a great step off point into the world of compute. And now we're starting to marry Linode's core compute with the notion of edge compute. So Linode, we still don't, we have, we had a, we bought 11 core sites. I think we added 10 more this year, but the, the core sites or the, the really centralized high capacity compute sites will number in the tens, right? But we still now want even deeper edge compute than that. So we're having next year, you'll see us deploy about a hundred much smaller satellite computes that are deep within the networks and married very closely with our on net distribution capabilities. So that's a great, for many media use cases, you want to be doing your compute. And this is for higher level compute. We also have edge workers, which is our serverless layer, our JavaScript serverless compute. That is executing in all 4,000 uh, regions. So we have serverless, then we have this edge-based heavier compute, and then we have our core compute in the center. And I think that that hierarchy suits itself very well to what many applications want. You want an outside layer that's got a high surface and we'll talk about all the things you can do right at the edge, especially with serverless. And then you come down to a heavier layer where you might want to transcode or prepare content. And then deeper down is where you're running your databases, your synchronization and your heavier business logic. Let's talk about that. Our focus is, is primarily media, but what, what edge applications are you seeing make sense for your customers these days? There's many, but uh, the, some of the obvious ones are ones that require personalization for every user who's connected. So, for example, uh, AB watermarking. You want to synthesize a unique stream of AB segments for each user. That's something that's an edge-based function. You, you don't want to run every request for every user to, down to some central authority. You'll just swamp it. So edge-based watermarking, also edge-based encryption. We can do HLS envelope encryption today, a unique encryption per user as the content's going out. That's another action you want to perform there. Um, then anything involving manipulation of playlists. So the, the beautiful thing about adaptive HTTP adaptive segmented media, HLS and Dash, is they're powered by playlists, right? They're powered by text files. And these text files are beautiful opportunities to manipulate content at the edge. They're very lightweight, but you can make changes to make changes to them very easily. And those changes are quite powerful. So if you want to localize your content, you can have a fat playlist that's listing 16 languages. And right at the edge, as the user connects in their AS, you can modify that manifest or playlist and strip out all the other languages and just leave the languages that that client needs. For HLS, for example, if you want to re HLS takes the first variant playlist as a signal for the one to start loading first. So you can manipulate that. Your network might have knowledge about what the throughput or the connectivity is for that client. And we can prepare an appropriate playlist for them so that they start at the right bit rate. You can filter content, you can put 4K in, you can take it out. Um, you can do a lot of manipulation. So that's geolocalization and personalization really popular talk about the you know who is who is doing this it sounds like the major publishers and you know getting over the technical you know what are they doing from a user perspective how do i see this if i'm if i'm watching in a in one of these regions it's very hard for you to see it because you're going to get something and you have no idea how that was synthesized. you might get a playlist that has four bit rates and two language options but actually it was a master playlist with 16 bit rates and eight language options. So as a user, you can't tell that it's, it's, it's opaque to the end user. And so it should be. You should just get content that's appropriate for you, for your device. It should be localized for you uh, and it should work. Um, that's the whole point of personalization. And you can also personalize actual pseudo live playlists at the edge, which is another area a lot of VOD distributors are getting into today. If, if you're a news organization and you've built up 10 years of VOD material, the fishing, fishing in, in Iowa or hang gliding in Atlanta, right? These are very niche subjects. There'll never be a live broadcast channel for them. 
that you can construct a pseudo live channel from VOD assets and put in dynamic advertising and stream, make a channel that's just for Jan or just for Will that we like. And it's going to advertise that high, that advertising is a much higher CPM because it's highly targeted and it's not broken out of, across a larger cohort. So dynamic content synthesis, especially of uh, linear streams, is also very popular at the moment. You know, what about cloud gaming? You know, we're hearing a lot about that. Is that an edge computing thing or is that going to be done, you know, at the origin? Yeah, so there's some cloud gaming that's done at the origin. You might want to authenticate against an origin, but there's two parts of cloud gaming that really require edge participation. So the first is we have multiplayer games, massive multiplayer games, or just multiplayer games, right? The, the users downloaded a, a large game download and the game is executing and running on their device, but the gameplay instructions need to go to a gameplay engine that is synchronizing playback and allowing the users to play the game. And to be fair to the users, you have to be very careful where you place that gameplay engine. Imagine you just had one on the US East Coast and West Coast and one in Europe. Then somebody from Africa joins or Australia joins, right? They, they are going to be so far behind everybody else because they, their RTT is higher. So, and it, you can, you know, the IP addresses of your connecting clients and you, there's, there's a lot of advanced algorithms for picking the centroid, the best set, the fairest centroid to, to run your game engine. But what if you don't have a data center there? If you've only got 10 in the world, you're stuck. So that's why having thousands of places you can run a game engine lets you move it closer to the optimum point. Um, and the second one for gaming is actually game synthesis, which is another level up in terms of edge compute. But this is where you have a very thin client. Your game is actually being played and rendered in a virtual machine at the edge. It's making unique stream for every player. Mm -hmm. And all the player's doing is watching a video essentially, and then feeding back user interface instructions back down to the engine. So that's also popular because it lets you play sophisticated games that you don't have the hardware or the software for on the client. The trouble comes in monetization. It's very expensive to encode a 4K or an 1080p stream for every single user. But with VPUs, and I think you're what, more well-versed in that world than I am, that cost of encoding is coming down. And I think that's going to mean the intersection of um, profitable game streaming from the, cap the, the, the capability to do it versus the ability to monetize it, that, that might overlap a little bit more in the future. You know, one of the things that's kind of confused me a little bit is the whole VOD to live. And we talked about that a little bit before, and you said that wasn't an edge application, that was more of a central application. What are the use cases you are seeing for VOD to live these days? What, are, what do they look like? Who, yeah, who so wants it? VOD, the typical VOD to live is a sports game, right? The sports game is played out live. And there's, there's two use cases. People either watch, or three, people are watching at the live edge, or people are late to the game. So they want to start watching one hour back from the live edge, but then they, they want to watch it play out live. And then the third use case is people who come back tomorrow and want to watch the game. So live to VOD is about allowing well, DVR no, no, window. Live to VOD, I get. It's it's VOD to live that's a little bit confusing. Oh, sorry. Me. Sorry, I, I confused it around. So VOD to live. So if you think about a, a live broadcast on a television station, even that one we're all familiar with, it's a sequence of programs, right? Those programs are all VOD assets that were shot last year or last month or 10 years ago, if you're watching reruns somewhere. And then you intersperse them with custom advertising, which is also VOD assets, right? And maybe news, which is shot live in a studio. And that's, that's your typical linear TV. So it's a sequence of a bunch of VOD assets interspersed with some live ones. Um, and most channels even don't have live news. So they're literally just a sequence of VOD assets that are played out as if, as if they were live. And we can well, do the same same thing on the edge. Yeah, uh, why wouldn't you just store it as a as a in a coding ladder that's already been transcoded? Seems like the transcoding cost is a major cost of that. Why would you store? Why would you go back to the mezzanine file for the broadcast? And you're not going to back to Mez at any point. You're taking these assets were encoded, and you've got a bitrate ladder, and and you you played your live you played your live event right, and now it's a VOD asset, or you've got a VOD asset okay. and you want to play it out as live. You don't need to re-encode them. 
Okay. You can you can you can adjust the timestamps if you want to, or you can play tricks with your manifests to offset the starting time, be it dash or, or HLS. But really, you just it's a sequence, it's a playlist of okay. VOD files that the user is getting. And so, then so the user a... interface on their device makes it appear like it's a live stream. So VOD to live isn't re-encoding, it's just making the not, the a, not at all. It's the avoidance of re-encoding. That's you're just playing with text files for VOD to live. You are okay. not touching the audio and video encodes. What is content steering? So content steering is new spec. Uh, HLS came out with it last year, dash, dash mirrored it this year. So normally players get instructions from a playlist or a manifest, right? And in those, depending on the format, there's alternate sources for their content. And they only move to these sources if there's delivery problems uh, that they experience. But different players will react in different ways. So some, if the player gets a 404 on a segment, some players will retry twice, some will retry three times, some will wait 10 seconds and try again. Others will switch bit rates. Others will give up completely and go try an alternate source. So the failover logic in both HLS and Dash is not specified tightly. So it's very hard to get a cohort, a large cohort, a million players to move consistently. If you want to move them from one CDN to another at any one time, there's no, before content steering, there's no way to do that. So what content steering does, it adds in a URL that the player connects to, to something called a content steering server. And that server sends a little JSON package with some information for the player. And what it does is it steers the player between sources of content that are already baked into the playlist. And it can actually clone or synthesize a new source of content that doesn't even exist yet, but is derived from looking at one of your existing sources of content in your playlist. So the whole point, the original point was to move uh, players in a, a cohort of players in a very deterministic fashion um, for QOE purposes to improve. If you knew a CDN was having performance problems, you could move them over. It turns out in the last year that there's other reasons to want to move cohorts of players. You might want to do it for economic reasons. One CDN is more expensive at prime time, but gives you better performance, but you want to switch away from it outside of prime time because then the other CDNs are okay. Or you want to switch because you're switching content. So there's a use case now where some people have 4K on one CDN and 1080p and below on another. And they use content steering to move their premium subscribers and steer them at the, at the original CDN. And I think we're going to find more opportunities for content steering as we go ahead. It's a very interesting way to control a set of players um, after having given them um, some initial play, playback instructions. And I think people are going to leverage it in different ways. What level of customer are we talking about for all of these techniques that you're describing? Is it, you know, we've got, you know, the typical pyramid of publishers on the internet, we've got the huge companies on top, and that's the, you know, 0.5% perhaps. I mean, how far down the pyramid do you have to go? So it's in going to be mostly like the 0.5% because they're the ones with a million players that they want to steer and they get the most benefit. They're the ones most likely to have multi CDN contracts to begin with and to want to invest in a steering service sufficiently to get the gains to, to move their players. So I really, it's, it's new. Like, I don't know, I know Brightcove are building a content steering service that can operate at scale, uh, but it, it's not as if there's a big market or established market for this. Yes, this is quite new. And it introduces a risk too. Your steering server can now become a single point of failure. If your steering server goes down or gives bad information or stale information, now you've made your, your QOE problem worse than it was before. At least your players were autonomous and they went off and did their things. Now they're they're tied to a service that's misdirecting them. Okay. So, so it's going to be the bigger people first, but that doesn't mean if you're a small company, you can't use it, or you might want to steer uh, in an innovative way. So you don't even need different CDNs. You could steer within different delivery properties within the same CDN. You could have a delivery property optimized for APJ and one optimized for EMEA, and you could steer people between it, for example. And what is one of the other kind of edge computing topics we talked about was program replacement. What is that? Who needs it? Who's using it? 
program replacement is doing something like inserting a bumper into a VOD file. And it might be for a sports team or it might be for a VOD asset. You can think of advertising as, as program replacement, but usually it's advertising is a separate insertion mechanism. And then you simply want the ability for give a given playlist to inject uh, a subset of files. And it's nearly always something to do with, with bumpers or, or pre-rolls, something like that. So that's another thing you can quite easily do with text file manipulation uh, at a serverless layer as you're delivering the playlist or the manifest to the end user. So let's let's switch topics to low latency. And you know, one of the things that happens in the industry is is you and I tend to live really at the forefront of standards as they come out, and we write about them and we talk about them and we argue which is best. But the market adopts them very slowly. So where are we with the the adoption of technologies like low latency HLS and low latency Dash and CNO? We're we're in the slow market adoption phase, I would say. Yeah, I was all excited. Dash low latency came out. <laughs> Four years ago, HLL HLS came out two years ago, but we've, 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 and we saw early deployments on the dash side because their, their requirement on the origin is much lower, right? The same, the same origin, an HTTP server works with low latency dash and standard latency dash is just using chunk, chunk transfer for the delivery or an aggregating response, I should say, because it works with HTTP three and that doesn't have chunk transfer. Um, HLS, on the other hand, places a much higher bar on the intelligence of the origin server. It has to follow HLS delivery directives. It has to follow skip instructions. It has to hold back. So low latency HLS takes your timing problem that Dash solves with in, basically by requiring the client to have a notion of time. HLS, the client doesn't need a clock, but it does need to know when to request content. And since that can get sloppy and your sloppiness is a function of your segment duration, um, you, need, you need to find some component that knows the right time to release content. And that's the origin. So HLS's timing model is basically shifted down to the origin, which needs you need a bigger origin. So we've just seen AWS Elemental release low latency HLS support. So that's, mm. that's, that's the cart, right? And now we put a horse in front of it, but there was nothing for the horse to pull <laughs> before that. Um, so I think you're going to see more LLHLS deployments. And there's also competitive pressure on the industry. Once, once the major sporting provider lowers their latency from 20 seconds to eight seconds or six seconds, which I don't really call low, but that's honestly where a lot of people are targeting right now, broadcast equivalent latency. Once they do that, then it's looking bad for everybody else. And then that will pull everyone else down to six seconds. And then below that, we get into what I call interactive levels of latency. This is the latency level where you want to tweet or throw hearts up on the screen or shout or cheer or make comments with some broadcast. Uh, and that's typically around the one to three second mark. So we're seeing low latency HLS, low latency dash target in production, target three seconds and up. They both have demos below three seconds, but when you when you look at scalability, it's higher. HESP from Theo Player does operate at the one second or 800 millisecond mark, um, but there's less players for it and it's not as broadly supported today. But it is an adaptive segmented solution that took once one of the problems with both HLS and Dash, which is you can only switch it at, at your segment boundaries, and it solved it by giving you, you know, much more diversity in segment boundaries, for example, or the equivalent of it. So you can switch quicker, and switching quicker is the secret to low latency and stable playback. Um, if you can switch out of trouble, if you can detect trouble and switch out of it quickly, then you you can keep your stream going with a small buffer. But otherwise, you have to buffer up to cover essentially the blindness you have about when you can switch and also waiting until the next switch opportunity. So you're looking back at the, you know, the 0.5% we talked about, are they embracing low latency now? And what's, what's their typical target? We've got the, the interactive applications for gambling or for auctions or for any type of um, interactive, but you know, the 0.5%, the broadcasters, what are they doing and why are they so doing it? Be, be careful of the language you use. By saying 0.5%, it's 
it sounds minimal, right? It sounds like a trivial amount that I don't have to worry about. Those 0.5% are probably delivering 90% of all video on the internet. So let's rather talk about 90% of all video on the internet and not worry about who it comes from. Right? So yeah, the first, the first <laughs> instances we're seeing of latency are, are people looking for broadcast equivalency for sports. And that's happening at a big scale. That's happening at millions of, of concurrent. What is the latency of that? That's five to 10 seconds or? It's in there, five to 10. It depends where you are in the world. If you're DVB T2 in Europe, you're gonna get three seconds. If you're in the United States on a cable connection, you can get 10 seconds. So it's not constant. You need to tune it. If you actually want to be precisely aligned with your, OT, your over the air or your cable broadcast, you need some way to tune the latency that the player is going for so that they are aligned. Uh, but in general, it's it's five to eight seconds, or I'd say six six to eight seconds, somewhere in there. And for people who have been operating at 30 seconds, they call that low latency. For people okay. who have been operating at eight seconds, they call three seconds low latency. And the WebRTC guys are going, <laughs> that's really not low latency at all. And they're all right. They just have different frames of reference. Well, and different applications and different goals for those applications. Yeah. So what is what is quick? What is uh quick is RFC 9000. It's an IETF protocol for uh, basically a binary transmission. A quick, quick is a protocol that gives you concurrent streams of reliable data. And it also gives you datagrams. So you can use this to move HTTP, but you can also use it to move media. And it turns out to be very useful. And you might say, why do I want unreliability in media? Well, the answer is because reliability comes at a cost. It comes at the cost of time in retransmitting data so that it does arrive reliably. So having the option not to waste time in retransmitting and to look at other schemes for how you might recover your data, that's nice flexibility. So Quick is, is the evolution of HTTP. It's replacing TCP within the HTTP stack. Um, but if I'm also working on media over quick, which is looking at how can we, how can we change media to start leveraging uh, quick and, and leverage some of the properties of quick so that we do actually get better performance at the end of the day than we do by simply using HLS or Dash with HTTP3. We have a question from Monica Gonzalez Montero, um, Telefonica Madrid. Why doesn't HLD admit bitmap subtitles? Something you can address? No, I don't. What is HL? I I don't know what HL. H, I'm sorry, HLS. It was a miss. It was a. Oh. Uh, Why do they do bitmap subtitles? I don't know. Um, I know a lot of Dash, so does Dash do bitmap? Yes, there's a big argument. You know, a lot of directors like bitmap subtitle, image-based subtitles, essentially, but they're much heavier weight uh, and they can't be translated, or for example, as can IMSC or um, uh, WebVTT subtitles. So uh, Monica, unfortunately, I don't know the answer as to why uh, HLS didn't support that. I would have said they did support it. So that just shows you my level of knowledge about uh, HLS and supporting uh, image-based captions. Okay, what about uh, media over quick from an overall architectural standpoint? Is that is that gonna give publishers a single architecture as opposed to having to support WebRTC and low latency variations? Yeah, so a couple of things. Media over quick is very interesting. Um, it has a number of goals. It's trying to solve problems. Um, and one of them is tunable latency. So media over quick allows you to do real-time conversations, which is the conversation we're having right now, sub 400 milliseconds from cam from glass to glass, 400 milliseconds or less. And then it allow, you can also do interactive, one second to three seconds, and you can do higher latency, five seconds and up. And you can even do VOD, which is infinite latency. So you can you now have a protocol that runs across the spectrum. So you can tie together use cases. You can tie the web conferencing use case or the webinar use case. You can combine that with sports streaming. And if you're bold, you can even combine that with your VOD delivery. So instead of having three separate networks now, 
you can have a single network. And when a single network can monetize itself across more of the market, it's cheaper for everybody, cheaper for the people running it and cheaper for the people buying it. Because if that network's not delivering your live sports event, it can be delivering your web conference and therefore uh, its, it's cost per bit is lower. So Media Over Quick is attempting to be a protocol that can, that can be used across a tunable latency spectrum and also through networks of third-party relays, aka CDNs. And that's one of that's if we look at the early, the early and, and the other attribute is it's a pub sub protocol, right? We're not, if you want to watch a media of a quick stream, you say, hey, give me the sports stream at 1080p. You make one subscription request for it. And for the next hour, you will get data. You don't have to ask for anything else. Whereas mm -hmm. HLS or Dash, every two seconds, four seconds, six seconds. You're asking for a text file and a video segment and an audio segment. You're making lots of requests. It's very chatty. Um, so PubSub is interesting. PubSub suits itself to media because media is inherently temporal. The encoder knows what the next segment is. The client wants the next segment. And it also wants it in the same order that the encoder is producing it. So the smoother we can make the pipe between the two, the lower the latency and the more efficient the transmission. But the challenge becomes, how do you cache that? And we need to cache that to get scale. We need to cache it to get the ability to play behind live and not only at the live playhead. Um, so that the challenge with mock is cacheability through third-party relays with tunable latency and with a common protocol that's used for both contribution, media workflow, and distribution. When do we see technologies like AI start to influence any of this stuff? So AI is already being used. I mean, the, the, the examples that show up at most of the media conferences are object extraction. So if we ran AI against my video, we'd say, oh, there's, there's a fern in the corner and there's flowers there and there's a male Caucasian of dubious age with a blue shirt and it would extract all this metadata and information out of the video. And that's very useful because you can search it then. It, it makes opaque video searchable. Um, I just saw output from ByteDance research paper where they're doing synthesis of video. So you can give a prompt, just like you give a prompt to an Im image. It takes an input video, you can prompt it, and it can change it in real time and produce a different video. And today, it's, it's, it's still a little awkward, but the image synthesis, if we go back two years, was equally awkward with Gen AI, and today it's it's scarily good. So the video synthesis is, is the worst it's ever going to be right now, and it will only get better. And it's going to get better to the point where you can say, I want to synthesize a video engineer from Akamai talking for an hour, and it will go. Uh, it will basically give me back. So I don't think we're far from that, and that's that's interesting. What, what I'm about... out of a job, but it's, you've got to train <laughs> it on some data. So maybe I can license my data. Yeah, don't stop publishing. What a, what about from a deliverability perspective? Or is this problem just so simple it doesn't lend itself to AI? In delivery, no. So there's a whole lot of, mach well, I don't like to use the term AI for engineering applications. It's machine learning, right? And and machine learning is really statistics. We're, we've got a bunch of data points. We're drawing a line between them. It's more complex than that, but it's also not more complex than that. We shouldn't, we're not going out to general intelligence to do useful things. So anomaly detection is a core part of machine learning, and that's very useful for log files. You know, Akamai gets over 100 million requests per second coming in, right? So a human can't possibly say, is this normal for right now? Um, does this look <laughs> like what it did? last Thursday at this hour in this location in this city? Is this, a, is this traffic request pattern coming in? Is that something that's typical? So for security analysis and for finding anomalies and, and detecting when a, a request might be malicious versus non-malicious, there's a whole suite of applications for ML. So you can see ML on the, the data analysis side. It's very good at, at doing that. It's very good at monitoring. It's very good at finding problems. It's very good at detecting when things are not quite right. You talked at, at the start about 
Akamai adding compute capabilities and security capabilities. Where is, is, is transcoding coming in as part of those compute or is that coming in as part of the CDN? So we're not, so we're not offering compute as a service today. We offer VMs on which people can then host FFmpeg or bring your, your favorite uh, encoding solution and run it, run it at the edge. So people are doing that today. And you know, edge-based transcode makes sense, especially in a user-generated world, because you've got video coming up from people's mobile devices. It's relatively heavy. You don't want to move it too far. You want to be able to process it close to where it's being produced. And then once you've processed it, you've shrunk its size potentially, unless you're just relaying it. And then you want to route it to people who are consuming it. So we're seeing applications on our network. Um, the nice thing with Akamai is we have this edge compute married with a very large delivery surface. We just hit a new traffic record last week, 384 terabits per second, which is a lot of traffic. If you go back to Akamai 2001, we crossed one gigabit per second. That was the entire network traffic and it was a big deal and there was celebration, one gigabit. So 384,000 times more traffic crossed our network last week than it did in 2021. That's ridiculous growth. And I think the next 20 years will go up. There'll be petabits per second, mm. petabits per second within years. Um, it, the, the rate of increase is growing. The rate of consumption is growing. Um, so, so where is transcoding, you know, high capacity oh. transcoding fitting into your product line? Back to transcoding. So it makes sense to do some transcoding at the edge. It, it makes sense to do other transcoding in the center of the internet where it's cheaper and more scalable. I think of edge compute as Miami, Miami real estate, right? Edge compute is your Miami beach real estate. You've got to want to be there because you're going to pay through the nose. It's expensive. It's a limited resource. So you need an application, which is I want to have a vacation and I want to walk out onto the beach. That's your equivalent. I'm going to pay to be in the beach hotel. But if you just want to work there, you can move five miles inland. It'll be much cheaper and you don't have the need to be at the beach. So a, a lot of use case, a lot of media processing use applications are power intensive, CPU intensive. And if you're simply just transcoding a library of video, that's not something to do at the edge, right? That's something to do in your cheapest data center. And cheapest is not just where it's running, it's I have to ingest these MES files. And the further I have to move content, if my data center might be cheaper to run it next to a hydroelectric plant in Buenos Aires, but I've got to move all this data down to Buenos Aires and then move it all back again. So your optimum location is going to be a blend of your transmission costs, both in and out, and your actual cost of transcoding. But it's almost certainly not going to be in a highly distributed edge, which is a lot of moving and into a lot of more expensive environments uh, uh, for content encoding. So how has transcoding, I guess, morphed from CPU to GPU to ASIC-based? How are you seeing that working out? So I think you're closer to that world than, than I am. I certainly, I've seen a whole lot of people doing CPU up till now. And I think IBC really opened my eyes to just the power, the, the, the huge jump or the, in, in capability or the decrease in cost per gigabyte out that, that VPUs are starting to bring to the table now. And I think economically, if you're not using some type of VPU, you're going to be challenged. Like, yes, it costs money and yes, it's hardware, but it's giving you such a bump in your capability that I think you're going to see it adopted in the cloud platforms. I, I can't, we're a public company, I can't speak about Akamai Roadmap, but it would make sense to me that if you're offering transcoding as a service in the cloud and Amazon R, that you should be looking at, at some type of VPU to, to basically give you the, the cost benefit. If you're not, other entrants are going to pop up and do that. So I think it's it's a shift. But at the same time, codecs are getting obscenely compute intensive. And they, you know, AV1 is that much harder to encode, and so is VVC. So it's a little bit of a game. The machines get more powerful, the VPUs get more performant, but then the codecs get ever more demanding. Yeah, we, we talked about the adoption cycle for low latency technologies. Isn't there kind of an analog with codec adoption? Every, you know, we were talking, I guess, 
AV1 shift in 2018, what percentage of video on your network would you, and I, I know you don't have a, a real handle. No, but you did a very interesting table, actually. Didn't you just do that chart where you showed that like 60% of all media on the internet today is ABC, which is a 20 year old codec? Yeah, it wasn't. I think that was the uh, uh, Tommy Flanagan and the, and uh, Mr. D Alex Davies at uh, Rethink had a had a chart like that. Um, okay. I think I reprinted well, it. The numbers yeah. are some there. The reality is the the majority, more than 50%, and I would guess in the 60, 70% of all video on the internet today is ABC, H.264. And that is a 20-year-old coding. And it, I was, for years I've been saying, look at the efficiencies. VP9, HEVC is now well supported on mobile devices. Name a device that doesn't support HEVC, yet it's still not being used. And the reasons, and HEVC is 10 years old at this point as well. 2013, so, yeah. So I asked, I asked a vendor who's well aware of the performance efficiency they get and, and the ability to re reduce their delivery bill in the long term. And I asked a vendor, why don't you do this? And he said, because in the short term, it's more expensive. I'm producing ABC and I got to produce my next gen codec at the same time. And I have to hire people who understand that. I have to redo all my encoding profiles. I've got, a, I've got this cost, the short term cost that comes in. And the trouble is media and entertainment is a competitive business. And a lot of people don't have roadmap to say, I'm willing, I'm willing to suffer for the next year in cost so that in the next five years I can benefit. It's just too hard to get over that hump. And people do. HEBC is coming up. AV1 will come with the, you know, with the Apple giving it the boost in hardware decode support. And I think VVC will come as well. But they come far slower than you would expect. Uh, and a lot of it is to do with this this cat this cat the friction in an exothermic reaction. You need you supply some energy to get it going. You need the same to convert your uh, encoding uh, your codec. Do you remember your cost per gigabyte for high volume transfers in in 2013? Because I think that's a big piece of it too. I'm remembering Brightcove coding like 50 cents a gigabyte. Um, it, not that it was ago. in the it was in the sense it is scary how how much it has fallen I, I I don't know if I can quote current Akamai prices but I, it's safe to say they well and well well under one cent per gig like well under one cent per gig and you can go to Amazon and look at their prices and we're not going to be that different but the point is to deliver a, a, a movie encoded at 1080p for two hours might be two gigs right? encoded in D or less encoded in a good codec. So it's costing the vendor like sub one cent to send that, that video to you. And you're paying them $18 a month, right? So the costs of distribution are really small, really, in the scheme of things. There's other big costs. Content acquisition costs way more than content distribution does. Um, so, and the sad thing about the CDN business, and one of the reasons Akamai is really attracted by compute and security is that if you look at your CDN bill, the price per gigabyte declines by about 15% per year, every year for 20 years. Like, would you like to run a business where the cost <laughs> of your core output goes down every single year by 15%? It's hard to do that. It has to be offset by an increase in volume, right? Otherwise we go out of business. And yes, there are increases of volume, but it's a perpetual battle for a CDN to offset the expectation that my bandwidth is cheaper and cheaper and cheaper every single year. So from a technical perspective, what's what's keeping you and other engineers at Akamai up at night? What are the what are the big problems you see coming up that that keep you keep you at your desk? My problems, Akamai's, we have people dealing with very, very different problems. Our problems are highly personalized. Like there's people worrying about scale, right? There's people worrying about security. There's people about building out for sufficient capacity uh, and schedule. You can't just get terabits of data in the Middle East next week. You have to plan months ahead for deployments like that. You have to deal with outages. And these systems are getting so large and complex that you, you can't rely on traditional QA to find bugs. Q, 
QA is about, here's a list of problems that might happen. I'm going to write unit tests for all of them. I run my unit tests and I know I won't have any problems. But in complex systems, you're, you have a combinatorial explosion of things that might happen that you can't anticipate all the conditions under which things go wrong. So you end up having to build systems that compartmentalize, they detect when problems are happening and they stop them spreading. And that's that's more important than trying to figure out up ahead of time all the problems that might happen. So in the networking world, it's it's complex. My what, what keeps me up at night in in particular right now. So I'm fo I'm focusing on mediocre quick. Um, it's in a nascent stage, but I think it's it's a very interesting opportunity. You don't get many opportunities to look at a next level media distribution system come up. I think it's a very interesting one, and the challenge is. To make it better than HLS or Dash and actually solve the problems. It's easy to produce architecture mm -hmm. slides that say we're going to do this and this and this. It's very different to make working systems at scale that do these things. So that's my current focus. It's so funny. CMAF came out when? It was oh, 12, 13? CMAF was about 2014, 2015, somewhere in there. And it really started paying dividends in the in the 21, 22, yeah. 23. Yeah, I remember you were moderating a a session <laughs> at Streaming Media West one that I was like the CMAF fan and everyone was like, yeah, I don't want another format. But yeah, these things take time. You know, CMAF is just, a, it's a common file format. And it's like, hey, if we use the same file format, then we get less, dif less different stuff to debug, better playback and less diversity of content. And we're slow to getting there. We still have the problem with CBCS and counter mode, but it's eventually it'll all be C CBCS and then we won't worry so much and we'll look back on it. But yeah, I'm, I'm always saddened a bit by the rate of, ch I shouldn't be, right? But I'm, these things take time to roll out. Even Mediova Quick, it's, it's going to take years. So let's not do a webinar as well. Mediova Quick is not successful because no one's using it in 2024, but that's fine. Let's look at 2028 and, and see where we are. Terry Fayet added a comment. I don't know if you saw it, that Comcast and Warner Brothers claim they stream HEVC to 60%, 60 to 70% of their devices, which um, they're pretty aggressive. We know that you know Netflix is pretty aggressive in, in what they do. I'm sure Amazon is as well, Hulu. So yeah, I it think... depends how you slice. I, I believe Terry's number. Terry Terry should know. If if you look at new devices, right? If you look at devices that came out in the last three years, that number is closer to ninety percent. It's old set top boxes, very weaker Android phones, people who haven't updated stuff that's eight years old. So it depends how broadly you want to support your market, and no one wants to give up five percent of their addressable market. So it forces you to carry ABC. And at that point, if ABC is good enough, I'm not going to incur the expense to go to HEBC. However, it's a simple calc. They look at their CDN bill and they go, ah, H if I do HEBC for the popular content, I, I only encode 20% of it, but I reduce by half my, my CDN bill. And then they do that. They, they it, reach the point at which the economics makes sense. It, it's probably worth stating Akamai is codec agnostic, right? You don't care. You just yeah. want to carry. We're a traffic. CDN. We it's binary objects. We move them. We are the we are FedEx for your media, right? We don't open the boxes. We can't open the boxes. It's encrypted much of the time, uh, and we don't want to open the box because anytime you're opening boxes, you're slowing stuff down. So we're just we're just moving them. But and, and you know, we care. Like yes, if everyone used the latest codec, the volume in theory would go down. But that doesn't happen. A, a codec swings both ways. You can use it for the same quality parity, reduce the size. You can also, for the same bitrate parity, increase the, the quality. And actually, your end users ju judge you not on the bitrate you send them. They judge you on the quality of what you send them. So there's market pressure to use a codec to raise the quality, not so much to lower the bitrate. And and of course, there's 8K and HDR and and uh, Meta. Um, so there's you know whenever compression gets more efficient, we want a bigger experience. We we expand like 8K is not so unreasonable. You can do 8K with 40 or 50 megabits per second quite easily. No, I'm talking with HEVC, uh, let alone BBC. 
And the codecs get more efficient as your pixel count gets larger. And it's, um, it, I just, this data is like two years old, right? But I did a study of looking with, with CMCD, we get the players reporting what's the throughput that they're seeing. And I looked for a large US distributor of VOD content. They were reporting year, year and a half to two years ago, 34 megabits per second, what the player was estimating as the throughput, right? So that's well above what I need for 4K. That's average. Yes, there's people who are sucking and there's people who have fiber, but the average was 34. So we're not that far from sending 8K, but 8K is ostentatious wealth in terms of distribution. It's it's mm -hmm. the Ferrari of driving and most people don't need it. They just want to get from it. They just want to watch a movie. And so we, yeah, I think it's, it's we, going to be very hard to make a market where you can warrant moving that much content all the time. We started before we went on air talking about our common time in Atlanta. And I remember the house we bought uh, off Northside and struggling to get a 28.8 modem working and looking at real video at, you know, 19 kilobits per second. And it's, you know, in, in, in the, the 25 years since then, it's just shocking how, uh, how much this has progressed. Yeah. Um, Do you know what, what's interesting? I was actually looking at a curve of um, Wi-Fi throughput capability for, for a phone. It was like a Samsung A something, a phone that's been produced for a decade. And they plotted with time, they plotted perfect Moore's law, which is doubling every two years. And they plotted Wi-Fi. It was exceeding Moore's law. So the ability mm -hmm. to stream data in your house has crept up hugely. And we used to like be laying RJ45s everywhere in our houses because that was cool and it was a tech world. You just don't do that anymore. It's way fast. Your Wi-Fi exceeds your, your capacity to consume. And we get to a point, as you mentioned, with Meta that eventually if, if I deliver like 16K to either eye, there's <laughs> diminishing returns on delivering more data. As a human, just can't perceive it. But at, at that point, I have to saturate my vision. I have to send an entire world. But there is this, it gets harder and harder to come up with use cases that increase. But for now, I, I think uh, metaverse type applications will be the next bump up in media content because you have to send a ton of data. You have to send a ton of data as long as you can't do something like foveated rendering. But you actually have to send a tiny amount of high quality data and then, and then, lower quality data will suffice for the rest. And I think our head tracking and our eye detection might get good enough that the direction we go is in sending a tiny amount of very high quality data, but being able to direct it just to the center of our eyes. Okay, we're we're out of questions and we're out of time. Will, it's, uh, we could probably talk all day. It's a pleasure to see you again. It's been a while. And um, I really appreciate the time you spent and the uh, expertise and the knowledge that you shared. So thanks for coming. All right. It's my pleasure to thank you to you and Anita for today. And I, I look forward to chatting with you and others in the industry at the next conference. Cheers. Take, take care. Good to see you.